So I'm Gene Perry, the Policy Director for OK Policy, and I'm excited to introduce today's keynote speakers. They're joining us from the Kansas Center for Economic Growth, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that conducts research and analysis to promote an advanced, balanced, responsible budget and tax policies that help ensure all Kansans prosper. Another way to say that is they're the OK Policy of Kansas. And I think, based on what you're about to hear, you'll agree that Kansas needs to pay attention to that independent, reasonable voice on budget and tax policies just about as much as Oklahoma does. Annie McKay joined the Kansas Center for Economic Growth as the organization's founding executive director in January 2013. Before coming to KCEG, Annie worked as a research analyst with the University of Kansas, coordinating and assisting with evaluation of early childhood and federally funded programs targeting low-income students. A Kansas native, Annie earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Kansas and has a master's degree from the University of Chicago. Dwayne Gosen is the Kansas Center for Economic Growth senior fellow. Before joining the center, Duane was a seven-term member of the Kansas House of Representatives and a state budget director for 12 years under three governors. Duane graduated from Bethel College in North Newton, Kansas, and holds a master's degree in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And so now I will hand it off to Annie, and she will tell us about Kansas's failed experiment. Thank you, Jean. Good afternoon, Oklahoma. Um, we're pleased to be here today, and I, I just want to start actually by recognizing and thanking um, OPI, David, and staff. Uh, can we give them a quick round of applause, please? It certainly is a compliment to be called uh, the OPI of Kansas, but I would say that we aspire to be the OPI of Kansas, and we've learned a lot from Oklahoma Policy Institute, you all have a gem of a resource in your state. Um, and to echo the comments that were made uh, by the board chair in opening, um, OPI is really looked to across the country. They're innovative. Um, they do exceptional research and analysis and have a really incredible staff, um, one of whom has a birthday today in the back of the room. Kara, uh, Kara Joy's birthday is today. Yes. So Dwayne and I feel, feel very lucky to be here today. Um, I think, you know, something that was said in the, uh, the remarks from the panel earlier from Secretary Hoskin, he said that Oklahoma uh, should really be the envy of the region. That's the aspiration. Um, but instead, you find yourselves locked in a budget crisis due to tax cuts. And like in Kansas, um, we're locked into this race to the bottom when both of us should be competing to be the best in our region. We're going to talk a little bit uh, about the failed uh, tax experiment in Kansas, and as Duane and I were remarking, this feels a little bit like a support group of states with budget woes and bad tax policy. Um, we, we may have uh, embarked on a similar journey, although we shortened the timeline up quite a bit. Um, so some of our results you may have yet to go to, or get to rather, but we'll preview those. Um, hopefully by the end of this though, by the end of your time here today, uh, this turns from a support group to a place of action. Um, and so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dwayne, and he's going to give uh, sort of the, the overview of the state's budget and what we did in Kansas, and then I'll talk a little bit about the key takeaways. Hello, everyone. It is very nice to be in Oklahoma and to join with Annie in uh, visiting with you a bit about what has happened in Kansas. Uh, this morning, Annie and I have been sitting over here at the corner table and observing what has been going on, and I have been struck by what a large group of people have turned out on a lovely day to talk about budget and tax policy of all things. Wow. And also struck by the very substantive and informative conversation that you have already had. And thanks very much for including a couple of Kansans in that conversation. Another thing that really struck me, especially as David gave his presentation this morning, was 
how similar the Kansas and Oklahoma story really are. David gave you a lot of charts, a lot of, a lot of graphs, and he could have just changed the word Oklahoma to Kansas, and, and they would have been perfectly applicable. Yes, the, the, some of the details are different, the numbers are a little different, but the lines, the, the trends, the outcomes, they're the same. The key problem that Kansas currently faces is that our revenue is far below our expenses. We have a huge gap. That's a problem that you face here in Oklahoma, too. And in both cases, it can be traced back to significant income tax cuts that have been implemented. In Oklahoma's case, uh, what I have learned this morning is that it goes back further than Kansas. They started sooner. They've been a little slower in implementation. In Kansas, we implemented tax cuts. Uh, the, the, the first tax cut bill was passed four years ago. So ours has been uh, a bit more, uh, the, the time frame has been shortened and it's been compacted. And as a result, uh, Kansas probably makes a pretty good case study on what happens when you dramatically cut income taxes. In fact, in Kansas, this has been termed the Kansas experiment because our governor, when, when, the, when the tax cuts passed, said, we are going to have a real live experiment on what happens when you do this. And I'm sure, uh, in fact, I know that he regrets those words now. He wouldn't, have, he wouldn't have said it that way had he perhaps known how this would come out. But we do have a real live experiment in Kansas, and that's what we'd like to talk a little bit about. I, I'm going to start with uh, just some budget basics. We won't dwell very long on this, but just to give you a little context on the, the kind of uh, budget and financial structure that Kansas has. Uh, we're, we're very similar to Oklahoma and to most states in how, how things are structured. We have our, our key fund is our general fund. That's where really almost all the action is. That's the fund that uh, uh, most state taxes come into. And out of that fund, we pay for education and human services. Uh, we also have a highway fund, which is supposed to be dedicated for highways, which uh, is funded through a fuel tax, through some sales tax proceeds, through a variety of other things. And we have about 10,000 miles of roads in Kansas that we maintain with that highway fund. There are a series of other funds as well in Kansas. Uh, federal funds are in that bottom box, uh, special funds where money is raised for a special purpose uh, is, uh, would all be contained in this box. But uh, the general fund is really the place, that's, that's what's considered the budget. Now, as trouble has developed in the general fund, even though this is not supposed to happen, money has been moved from almost any fund in state government where money can be taken and moved, especially from the highway fund, moved up to support what is happening in the general fund. Kansas currently gets most of its income into the general fund through two main sources, individual income tax and sales tax. You can see here right now, it's most, uh, the majority uh, of the money comes from sales and use taxes, individual income taxes down to 40, 40% 40 in this current fiscal year. It's actually by now even a little lower than that. But uh, individual income tax used to support about half of the spending in our state general fund. But we are on this slide where individual income tax is being replaced 
by sales tax and other kinds of consumption taxes. We, we have a few other smaller taxes in Kansas which also support uh, our general fund spending, including a small severance tax on oil and gas, but it's not nearly the factor uh, in Kansas that uh, it is here in Oklahoma. If we look at where we spend our money in the Kansas General Fund, 50% uh, is spent out on public education, another 17% on the Kansas share of Medicaid, 12% uh, on higher education, and then there are some slices in here for other human services, public safety, and general government. But what David told you this morning is also true for Kansas. If you add up all the categories of education and human services, 90% uh, of our state general fund is spent out somehow on those, those two things. So if anything big is happening in our state's budget, it's affecting education and human services. In Kansas, it's possible that we, we spend uh, a bit more on education probably as a percentage than many states do, partly because our state general fund is the primary funder of public education. It's a deliberate decision that Kansas made about 20 years ago, uh, but that tends to push up percentage spent on education. Now, let's ask, what happened in Kansas? Four years ago, in 2012, our lawmakers passed very significant income tax cuts. They lowered rates. Uh, in the very first year, rates were lowered substantially, about 25%. And then a schedule was set up so that income tax rates would decrease year after year after year. And then finally, there was a formula put in place with trigger mechanisms that would continue to reduce income tax rates until we hit zero. Uh, sometimes it was referred to as the march to zero. The, the, the policy, the policy uh, uh, goal was to completely eliminate the income tax as a source of revenue in Kansas, even though at the time it brought in about half of state general fund income. In addition to the rate cuts, Kansas also exempted what uh, uh, we term business pass-through income completely from any income tax liability. We're the only state in the nation to do such a thing where we tax some income but completely exempt business income. That means for if you're an individual and you get uh, your income through a limited liability corporation, or if you are self-employed, uh, or if you receive rental income, or if you have farm income, all those kinds of income are exempt from income taxes entirely. And that was part of the first wave of the cuts. In, in essence, uh, it, it's a bit of an oversimplification, but not too much. If you earn a paycheck in Kansas, if you have a salary check, that, that money, that income is taxed in our income tax system. If you get your income in some other way, it's exempt. Now, all of that was done on the premise that such a large income tax cut and the exemption of business income from taxes altogether would bring about dramatic economic growth. And the growth that occurred would so fuel the economy that revenue would continue to flow in to the state, uh, tax revenue would continue to flow in in other ways and still fund the budget. We could cut taxes, spur tremendous economic growth, and still fund the budget. Doesn't that sound wonderful? It's, it's a tremendously seductive argument. And our lawmakers bought that and put those things in place. And what do you think happened in the first full year of implementation? <laughs> well, 
Income tax revenue dropped like a rock. Of course it did. Normally, in a normal year, income tax revenue could be expected to increase. And that'd be true in any state. In a normal economic time, people make a little more money, they pay a little more in income tax, salaries, wages rise a little bit, uh, e economically things are moving up a little bit and people pay a little more in, and in a normal time, income tax receipts would rise. In Kansas, we used to think of it as an average of uh, income tax, we could count on income tax increases in a normal time to go up four or five percent, at least, and in a really good time, they go up a lot more than that. But not only in that first year of implementation, in that first year of implementation, not only did income tax receipts not rise, they fell very, very, very sharply. And as a result, we, uh, our, our line, <laughs> if you graph it, the line that depicts revenues and the line that depicts expenses, well, they crossed immediately in that fiscal year. In fiscal year 2014, Kansas had far less income than it needed to support the expenses that, uh, that, that it had. And it's not that Kansas has had lavish expenses. Uh, if, if you look at the kinds of things we're spending money on, uh, you could, again, take David's charts and apply them to Kansas. Our operating expenses for schools, the money that we give to schools to operate, down. Teacher salaries, about equal with Oklahoma, uh, very far down. Uh, we, uh, we are experiencing significant problems in our state institutions because of staff shortages in our prisons, in our state hospitals. We just had a state hospital decertified. Higher education, flat or down. We uh, also uh, have waiting lists for social service uh, programs. And we have also, as, as, is, as is the case in Oklahoma, not expanded Medicaid. So we've, we've had our expenditures completely squeezed, but even after the squeeze, even with the squeeze, we have expenditures up here, revenue down here, directly as a result of these tax cuts. In the first year of that, uh, Kansas had some reserves and spent half of them to fill the gap between revenue and expenses in fiscal year 2014. But the gap grew in fiscal year 2015. Income tax revenue didn't get better, it got worse as, as uh, more, more tax rate cuts kicked in. And in fiscal year 2015, which ended last summer, uh, Kansas cleaned out the remaining portion of its reserves, and that did not uh, cover the full gap, so we pulled money from the highway fund and from just about every other fund in state government that uh, had any money in it. But of course, spending the remaining portion of the, rever of the reserves and grabbing money from other funds, that didn't fix the problem that covered it for one year, but didn't fix it. So our legislature then faced a even bigger gap, uh, kind of like that crater that David showed you on the, on the screen this morning. Uh, when they met a year ago, when they came uh, to, the, to Topeka to set the fiscal year 2016 budget, they had a crater like that. And even though they had squeezed expenses to the point where they felt they could not take them down any further, they were still facing a gap of hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. We ended up last year with the longest and most difficult session, legislative session in Kansas history. And in the end, our lawmakers raised taxes, but they raised sales tax and cigarette taxes, they did not revisit the tax cuts that had caused the problem. And they raised revenue, and the revenue they raised did help 
the revenue line go up, but they didn't raise revenue enough to really cover expenses. They still ended up filling a large portion of the gap by transferring money from the highway fund and what was left in other funds. So in essence, uh, even though uh, we have squeezed expenses, even though we have raised sales taxes to a, a, a high level for, for Kansas, even though we have grabbed a lot of money from other funds, we are still in a position where going forward, we do not have enough revenue to meet even a conservative set of expenses. And that's not going to get better, it's not going to fix until we somehow in Kansas can improve that revenue line. Now, <laughs> you got a little preview of one of the takeaways there. <laughs> I want to show you just one slide before I hand back to Annie. And that's a, a slide which tracks who actually benefited from the tax cut that was implemented in Kansas. Again, remember, we've got a, a short window here where, where all of this was implemented. And in that period of time, we have both lowered income taxes sharply Yes, that's a tax cut that uh, in, in many ways affected uh, every Kansan. But we've also raised up the sales tax. We've eliminated a variety of income tax deductions and a variety of credits that uh, helped low-income Kansans. And in the end, even though we have not raised sales taxes and other taxes up enough to, to get back to the place where we have enough revenue to cover expenses, Here's what has happened. The lowest earning Kansans, that's the, the lowest, that, that's the, the bottom 20% of Kansans in terms of earnings, their tax bill goes up as a result of this. It's not, not hard to understand. Next 20% up, so we've got 40% of Kansans who didn't participate in this tax cut, they got a net tax increase. Middle-income Kansans got a little net tax cut out of that, but hardly enough to notice it. But the real benefits of this have accrued at the upper end. No question about that. And that has all happened at the same time as our budget and our ability to afford what we need to, uh, need to uh, pay for in state services has gone down. So that's our situation. Uh, I'm going to hand off now to Annie and she's going to uh, uh, give you some takeaways and some analysis of, uh, of this. So before I do that, I just want to take a quick time out uh, and say that we're going to sort of step away from this doom and gloom story and tell you that Kansas is a fantastic place and we have some room in the car. Um, if anybody wants to come back with us, we're recruiting uh, to bring people into the state. Um, and we also want to promote it as a vacation destination. Uh, so you all are just a short drive away. We could use the revenue, help your neighbor out. But that being said, I'm gonna get to the three, I, I'm glad you guys appreciate that. I'm going to get to the three key takeaways, and, and I think if you're, if you're somebody who tweets, um, I might kind of uh, do this in hashtags, and the first hashtag would be hot mess, uh, the second hashtag uh, would be magic math, and the third hashtag would be don't be like Kansas, which was actually a campaign at some point. Dwayne pulled the curtain back on the first takeaway, and it's Kansas is broke. Uh, and while you may be able to relate to this, the important piece is here that we're broke even after the largest tax hike in state history. That's pretty remarkable. We still don't have the money to pay the bills. We're living paycheck to paycheck, lurching month to month, not knowing uh, what our revenue situation is going to be like. 
In addition, we don't have a rainy day fund. We have no money left in the bank account. The 50 state average of reserves is a little over 7%. Kansas's reserves, zero. And we're headed into, I mean, while oil and gas uh, prices impact certainly Oklahoma and Texas and other states greater than it does Kansas, it does have some impact on us, as do ag prices. And we're heading into another slowdown with no cushion and no reserve whatsoever. And it's simply not a good place to be. Dwayne mentioned uh, the revenue and the expenditures. And so th this, this PowerPoint will be available online afterwards so you can sort of see the nitty gritty details. But in this, uh, just to, to illustrate to you those two lines, those are the, the bills that we've got to pay and the money that we've got coming in, you want those two lines pretty close together. And if you can't see in the back of the room, they're not close together. <laughs> our revenue, which is the bottom line, is way below our ongoing reoccurring expenses. That's one of the problems, reoccurring. We don't have the reoccurring revenue as a result of the income tax cuts to meet our reoccurring expenses. Even in this picture here is after that tax hike we, we mentioned. We didn't close the gap. We didn't go back and fix the problem. And then the things that we did do didn't close the gap all the way. After that uh, largest tax hike in state history, so our fiscal year runs June 1st, uh, July 1st to June 30. So when we hit the new fiscal year this last July 1st, immediate budget cuts, immediate sweeps and transfers. That was after the state's longest legislative session in history. And we still face yet another shortfall this fiscal year, the one we're currently in right now, and the one that starts on July 1st. We've cleaned everything out, as Dwayne talked about. And just to put some, uh, some context to those funds that we've tapped into, we cleared out our funds for early education programs, like Early Head Start and Parents as Teachers. We went through and raided that. It should have $200 million in that account. It's got $140,000 left in it at a time when we know tobacco revenues are going to be coming in less to the state. So we're facing some pretty significant issues. We've similarly cut education budget, budgets, and we have a lawsuit pending uh, around how we fund education. We're in such dire straits with our education that we actually moved to a block grant formula um, so as to you know, uh, try to shore that up. But similar to you all, our schools are feeling it. So I think this is actually putting it pretty nicely, uh, that our economy is sputtering. Um, I would say if we were describing this like a vehicle, our check engine light is on and we're stalled out on the side of the road. When we look at what's happening with the Kansas economy, part of what Dwayne talked about on the business tax cuts, those 330,000 small businesses, the design behind that, which by the way, no other state in the country has done that. For good reason, it's not effective as economic development policy. Um, it's been criticized by both the left and the right as being one of the dumbest things that was done as part of Kansas' tax package. So when we look at that, it was supposed to drive job growth. And when you break down the benefits of those 330,000 small businesses, only the top 1% of small businesses in Kansas saw enough from that tax break to create one job in one year. The other 99% of Kansas small businesses don't benefit to the degree that they need to create that job. So it essentially just acts as a giveaway, not as an economic driver. We continue to lag the region and the country in terms of private job growth, and we're not even talking about public jobs because that's not been part of the Kansas conversation. We're simply looking at private job growth. And when we look at the private jobs that we are adding to our state's economy, we started this experiment, much like I heard on the panel earlier, with look out Texas, here comes Kansas. And that means something entirely different to me, but I also am not a neighbor to Texas. So y'all may have a different perspective on that. But I know some of the issues that Texas faces. And I also know that some of Texas's prominent job growth was in low wage industries. Well, guess what? Kansas's fastest growing jobs are in low wage industries. Jobs that are paying wages that are not going to lift Kansas families out of poverty, like retail and food industry and home health care aids. That's where we're seeing the greatest boom. If we talk about, so this chart here comes from, from a report that we did, and the high-level takeaway is that the governor has a council of economic advisors. And he put together this council of economic advisors when he came into office because he said he wanted to have a set of metrics to measure Kansas by, to see how we were doing so that we could adjust policy accordingly. The red boxes are bad. 
The green boxes are good. You can see in sort of a bingo fashion, we get, a, we get bingo here on one line, and that's the unemployment rate. Kansas's unemployment rate has historically been low. We've historically led the region in terms of unemployment. But in all these other areas, we're not beating the region. But have we adjusted our policy? No. And in fact, last year when the legislature proposed, hey, let's go back and revisit that tax plan. Let's go back and close that loophole on small businesses because it's not effective. The governor threatened to veto it. And so instead, they turned to the sales tax. Those income tax for some, as Dwayne showed on the chart, you can see that the top 1% certainly benefited the most. The top 1% of individuals and of businesses, some benefited from the income tax cuts while everybody experienced tax hikes in other ways. We've raised the sales tax twice. The first time we started down this path in 2012 and 2013, the sales tax was supposed to have sunset. We kept it at its elevated rate. We also did away with important deductions and credits for low-income families. We had a food sales tax rebate. We did away with that. We had a property tax credit for low-income folks, for renters. We did away with that. We had a child independent care credit. It's gone. The last thing that we have remaining in Kansas is the earned income tax credit, because we did away with everything else to pay for these tax cuts. But it didn't go far enough, because you can't squeeze blood from a stone, and it turns out low-income folks in Kansas don't actually have enough money in their pockets to pay for these tax cuts. So we had to come back and raise sales tax again, and it still isn't paying for it. Our tax plan sounds very similar to y'all's, right, in terms of the stair step, the trigger mechanism, except that we just went further, faster. It doesn't matter if you start small and incremental as you all have done over 15 years or go big or go home like Kansas. It's not going to work. And we've learned some pretty valuable lessons. We have, Dwayne and I have. We're still waiting for some other folks to catch up. But when you look at this, Dwayne showed this chart. You can see that it was a net tax increase for the poorest 40% of Kansans. And you bump it all the way out to 60% of Kansans, and that's a pretty negligible tax break, $29. What this doesn't take into account are other taxes, like property taxes, have gone up across the state. Schools have increased enrollment fees all over Kansas, small districts, large districts. We're seeing other services, other county and city services, uh, levy fees where there were once none because they're trying to make up for state budget cuts. So this doesn't take into total account all of the other things that are rising in Kansas as a result of this failed experiment. This was something that we put together last session to look at exactly where Kansas fell in terms of sales tax impact. And you can see that we're below you guys, so thank you for that. But when we talk about this, and we talk about the impact to business, because that's been the conversation in Kansas. We want to grow Kansas business. We want to attract people here. You know what hurts the bottom line of business? property tax and sales tax. And what's going up in Kansas? Property tax and sales tax. Earlier, someone on the panel talked about Texas. And if we want to be like Texas, we have to have the conversation about what that really means. What that really means is higher per capita property and sales tax. It's actually like that for all of the no-income tax states. And that's the part of the story that isn't always told. It's certainly the part of the story that wasn't told in Kansas when we started down this path. But what have we seen since we started the march to zero, as it is affectionately known? In the office, we call it the march off a cliff. But since then, we have raised sales tax, and we still don't have the reoccurring revenue we need. If we look at property taxes in Kansas, which are arguably higher than what you all face, you can see this map here. And what I'll tell you is that the darker the color of the county is, the higher the increase in the property tax. This disproportionately impacting rural counties, 17 of the highest 20 property tax increases were rural counties. And that's the tool that they do have. They also have sales tax. So, so while that certainly is a tool that actually was available to them, uh, the legislature is now has passed a property tax lid for locals, um, and they're accelerating that lid. Um, but we can see that that's how local communities have gotten by. But there's a limit to that. And if you talk about the business aspect, 70% of Kansas businesses, 70% of their tax burden comes in property and sales tax. So how attractive are we in protecting this 3% income tax burden for 70% of what they actually pay, which is rising? 
We're often accused of not being the best salespeople for Kansas. A lot of criticism that this message that we're spreading is not drawing people in. Well, this is actually the truth, and this is what people are feeling on the ground. There's a greater awareness in our state now of what's happening. If, if there's anything that we could depart uh, upon you is that we are right now where you will be in a couple of years. Kansas once had, if you think of Kansas, the state of Kansas as a family, we were a two-income household, pretty evenly distributed between income tax and sales tax. And back in 2012, there was this grand idea that we would go and quit one of our two full-time jobs and that it would all be okay. Um, the governor is on record as saying, I don't know how it works, but it works. It turns out it doesn't work. <laughs> but be that as it may, this last session, instead of going back and working two full-time jobs, we said, well, let's just go work more hours at sales tax. Let's clean out all of the accounts we have for the children's college fund. Let's run up the debt on the credit card. Let's pull from the account that we have to keep our house in repair, the highway fund. Let's do all of those things instead of address going back and working two full-time jobs. At some point, I think that we'll probably get back to having that conversation. In 2016, our full legislative body is up for election. Uh, someone said earlier on the panel that people are more concerned about their political futures than the future of the children. And I uh, think that that's probably maybe true to some extent in Kansas as well. But we'll, we will get back uh, to having a more balanced, reoccurring revenue structure. Um, but we encourage you to get back there sooner so that we can both begin competing to be the envy of our region. So with that, Dwayne and I would be happy to take questions. It's going to feel like hitting a brick wall at 60 miles an hour. Uh, but that's Kansas. So we'd be happy to take questions if anyone has some. Or we can process our feelings and have a group cry. Annie, Ryan's going to have the microphone back here and walk around. So raise your hand if you have a question. As you were... Are we on? Yeah. yeah. As you are formulating questions, I would... Uh, just put one additional note in. This, this morning, a figure was uh, given to you that if Oklahoma had not cut income taxes in the way that it has, you would currently be receiving a billion dollars more in revenue through the income tax today. And that same figure is true in Kansas. If we had not implemented income tax changes in 2012, we would be receiving a billion more in revenue today. I have a question. Um, I'm in public education, and um, I'm an administrator of a building, and I'm dealing with teachers who are um, crying because they're going to have to retire early. They do that in sacrifice for our teachers who are young and have families. So it's hard. It's hard. Um, what I'm wondering is, um, since you guys have had this happen faster than we've had it, are you looking at projections on how long it's going to take for us to see any light of day? How, how many years are we looking at? I feel like we should pass out medication if we're going to answer that question. <laughs> I believe Kansas has been undone for a generation, maybe longer, because um, it's... When you cut a revenue source like the income tax as sharply as we cut it, and really as sharply as you are cutting it, it's very, very, very difficult to get it back when you need it. And it's even more difficult in Oklahoma. You, you heard the discussion about the extraordinary vote that it requires to, to, to raise revenue in Oklahoma. We, we do not have that in Kansas, and even though it's easier in Kansas to raise tax revenue, just requires a majority vote, uh, it's still very, very difficult. Even though a strong, strong majority of Kansans have, have woken up to the situation that we're in and uh, are very discontented with it, even so, it's, it's still politically very difficult to get back what you once had. So it's, it's, we're in for a long haul. I would say, you know, uh, Dwayne talks about a generation, and I think that that's accurate. But, you know, earlier, 
um, it was said that budgets are not numbers, budgets are people. And we talk about what Kansas has done in terms of transferring from the highway fund and deferring road maintenance, and certainly those things will cost us more in the future. It's much like if you make a, don't make a repair to your house and put it off. We know that that's going to be more expensive. But when we're talking about early education and we're talking about education, those are years that you don't get back. We're not just talking about costs in terms of welfare or in terms of corrections or in terms of fewer earnings. We're talking about brain development that isn't going to happen in the lives of Kansas children because we're pulling away from early education, we're pulling away from K-12. And that's not just like a warm, fuzzy, feel-good thing, that's actually an economic driver. Our biggest workforce development initiative in Kansas is our public school system. We are pulling back from that. What signal does that give to business? Oh, by the way, you should come here. We don't know that we have the trained workforce for you. Pay no attention to the rising sales and property tax. Our education system is crumbling, and we have giant holes in our roads. None of that is a good signal. Those things that we're pulling back from, much like you all are as well, are the investments that matter, are the things that will grow your economy and our economy. We're looking at this wrong. Kansas has been backing into budgets rather than stopping and saying, what is it that we need and structuring revenue to meet those needs? <clears throat> My name is Dan Arthur. I'm from Tulsa. Uh, in terms of the property tax, uh, in Oklahoma, about uh, roughly a third of education funding for public, public schools comes from local property taxes. And I just wonder, how, is local education also funded in Kansas with property tax? And is that an avenue we should be exploring? Kansas, Kansas uh, the Kansas General Fund is the primary payer for, for public schools. And roughly two-thirds of what it costs to operate public schools comes from the state. But we also have a statewide property mill levy of 20 mills, which applies everywhere around the state, which is entirely uh, uh, dedicated to education. And formally, that was collected locally and sent to the school district in which it was collected. Uh, currently, now that's been changed to come in to the state and pass through the state treasury for about a minute and a half and then sent back out to schools, but it's, it's done that way so that the state can count it as a, as a, as a resource to education or as a, as a state payment, but we do have, have a local property tax component. And then there are some ways in which local districts can also raise property uh, or raise funds uh, locally by using property taxes in addition to what I just said. In terms of that local uh, effort um, that, that school districts have, that tool, 85% of Kansas school districts are maxed out on that tool. And they're maxed out because we've been cutting education budgets through the recession and then after the recession as a result of the tax policy. So they actually can't go any higher. They're, they're, com they're completely maxed out at the local level at the same time the state continues to cut its contributions. That's, uh, the question is, is that, is that the reason for the increases shown on the map? Some of the reason. Um, also, there's a significant amount of money that flows from the state to local governments, counties, and cities um, for c community corrections, public libraries, education, and you know, a whole host of other things. That's been cut off. We also used to have funds that flowed from the state to local uh, counties and cities um, called uh, the Local Ad Valorem Tax Reduction Fund to help offset the property tax. Uh, we haven't funded that in I don't know how long, to the tune of about $700 million. Um, so so that's, that's part of why this is, uh, this is increasing across the state. But there's no, there's no question that as you cut off school funds in Kansas and do less from the state level, it pushes the the property tax, uh, it puts pressure on the property tax and pushes local rates up to the extent that, the, that that's allowed under our, our rules and formula. And that especially hits rural areas the hardest. I'm almost afraid to ask this question, but you mentioned admission fees. Are you talking about admission fees to 
what we call common education. Enrollment fees enrollment have fees. enrollment yes, fees for public yes. schools have increased. That is a tool that districts have had, um, and so you have districts across the state that have increased enrollment fees. What are enrollment fees? Fees to enroll your child in public school. That's why I said I was afraid to ask the question. If there are any legislators here? Please ignore that. But that. That same kind of dynamic is also true in higher education in Kansas. I'm sure it is here in Oklahoma, too, as, as the state contribution has declined, tuition fees have been pushed up uh, sharply. I, I told you guys, hashtag, don't be like Kansas. I mean, I think we established that. Yes, sir. I wanted to know if anyone's called Charles and David Koch in Wichita and thanked him for your tax plan. <laughs> the other thing, I really appreciate your coming. We have a common problem. Our governor always totes Texas. Now I know why she didn't tout Kansas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do they live in a gated community with armed guards or what? <laughs> um, Art Laffer, as was referenced earlier, um, was the architect of the Kansas plan. We actually paid him $75,000 to come up with this idea, which stings just a little. Um, but, but back in 2012, we brought in Art Laffer, um, paid him this contract, designed this plan that was supposed to just make it rain money all over the state. And it, it, it never has. And, and it was earlier uh, described as it was to be the adrenaline shot to the heart of the Kansas economy. And they've since stepped back on that, um, seeing that, it, that after four years, there is absolutely no adrenaline whatsoever. And now it's, it's, it's experiments. It's, it's going to take time. And the fact of the matter is, it's just simply not going to come. We know that. And if we can impart any lesson upon that, it's stop the march to zero, your march to zero as well, it's not gonna stimulate your economy. Thank you, when I was a student 20 years ago, we had problems with the manufacture of uh, air conditioning equipment, and we found out who owned it, the Koch brothers, and guess what they wanted, a write-off. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah. Just a bit in further response to your comments and questions, the, the portion of our tax cuts which give uh, a complete income tax exemption to business income has especially benefited very large employers and employers or, or businesses that are privately held and organized into limited liability corporations. And the money that flows through them, including some very large corporations is completely tax-free in Kansas right now. Several years ago, my name's Mary Jo Kinsey. I'm the uh, executive director for the Oklahoma chapter of the National Association of Social Workers. Excuse me, my throat's sore. Um, several years ago, and it was before the budget fiasco that you're experiencing now occurred, um, the state had decided to contract out um, coverage or for child, uh, not child support services, but child protection services to private companies. Um, and I don't know if, you've, if the state of Kansas has done that with other human service programs, but this was a big deal because there was a lot of concern that privatizing Child welfare services was already a questionable issue, but now that you guys are literally at the wall, how are those kinds of programs continued to be funded through contracting? What's happening there? Do you know anything about that? Our, our uh, not the child protection services, but the foster care system is privatized. And we have also, in essence, uh, privatized our Medicaid system as well. Uh, we have uh, transitioned to a system called CanCare, which is essentially uh, a subcontracting our, our Medicaid services uh, to three uh, 
in essence, insurance companies who, who then, uh, who then uh, provide payment services and management services uh, to, to Medicaid clients. Now, I don't think that that transition to private, uh, private Medicaid management has necessarily, uh, there would be people in Kansas who would very definitely argue that the administration of that has not worked out well, but in terms of costs by contracting, some of the costs have been frozen in and, and certainly Medicaid costs do rise over time, that's health care costs, and, and, and through that contracting system, uh, we have uh, very definitely built in uh, some key costs that uh, must be paid for in a, in, as part of our budget process. I think we have time for one more question. Everyone's afraid to ask. <laughs> Um, I'm from Kansas. <laughs> I knew there were some other people in the room who were just afraid to admit it. Uh, I mean, I'm not now. I'm from Oklahoma now. I grew up in Kansas. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, I, about 30 to 35 percent of my Facebook friends are from Kansas. So I hear a lot of stuff about this through, on Facebook, social media. <clears throat> I'm just kind of wondering, and this may not be a very fair question, but what do some of the Kansas former statesmen, you know, that were so highly respected and still are, Bob Dole, Nancy Castlebaum, some of those wonderful people from the past, where do they comment on this or are they in hiding? Um, what's the movement? What's, what's the movement like? Is there a growing movement? Is, is, is something happening along those lines? I think in terms of um, our federal delegation, um, I don't think you know, current or former um, that we hear a lot of commentary uh, from those folks um, in regards to what's happening in Kansas now. I do think that we hear a significant amount from former state elected officials. Uh, you know, Dwayne is a seven-term member of the House of Reps and former state budget director. He's not alone. Um, and uh, former policymakers of, of all stripes recognizing um, that this is not good policy. Not having reoccurring revenue to match your bills is uh, not a good place to be and working to address that. And I, and I think that that's part of the momentum you saw in 2014. Um, I think a lot of people look in on Kansas and say, you know, good Lord, how did y'all not understand then? And you know, the state wasn't on fire then like it is today. Um, the difference today is that while Rome burns, uh, instead of doing something about it, our current um, proponents of the March to Zero are simply just sort of spraying gasoline all over the state. And Kansans have picked up on that, and that's the important thing. Um, this all didn't come quickly, because as Duane talked about the revenue loss, which we lost more in one year than we did in the three years of the Great Recession combined, we did have some cushion, we did have some ending balances, and so people didn't feel the pain immediately. But it's being felt now. When you have a school district whose superintendent gives up their salary so that they can make payroll, that's actually a big deal. When you have a rural hospital that closes, that's actually a big deal. We have those things happening all over the state in rural and urban, and Kansans are waking up to that, not only those folks who are formally elected, but also the citizens as well. And I think that that's, that's certainly the important piece. Um, you know, I think Dwayne and I both believe as, as proud native Kansans that this really doesn't match our values um, shared across the state. It's just taken some time to learn some very hard lessons uh, that will take um, decades, if not a generation, to recover from. This also is not a purely partisan issue in Kansas. There are both Republicans and Democrats who are, are very concerned and, and very uh, uh, active in trying to, to find corrections to this. Um, and across Kansas, if you look at the, the recent polling on a variety of issues, it's very clear that Kansans uh, 
the, the vast majority of Kansans feel that our experiment has failed. It's very unpopular, uh, and that is reflected in, in a number of measures, including our governor's uh, approval rating, which is at historic lows. And exactly how to uh, harness that discontent is, is uh, a bit what's at issue here, and how to, how to turn that into positive policy uh, production is, is what uh, many in Kansas now are, are, are trying to do. All right, will you please join me in thanking Annie and Duane? We know it's a hard task to come south of the border and um, share that story, which is, which is a tough story. I think uh, there are things that we're hopefully going to learn from that um, and things that, that you know, I think they can take back from um, Oklahoma to Kansas and understand that they're not so all alone in the, struggle, in the challenges they face. Um, Annie alluded to the superintendents and the hospital administrators. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break and hope you'll have a chance to um, socialize and meet some uh, new people. And then when we get back, we're going to hear directly from those on the front lines, uh, from the superintendents and social workers and teachers who are dealing with budget cuts every day, and also what we can do to try to turn things around here in Oklahoma and come, move into session with a positive agenda. Thank you.